Chapter 4, Unit 6 Frequency Distribution Graphs. This is how you would show a graph with a population distribution that has a mean of 80 and a standard deviation of 8. You would draw a line down the middle of the graph showing where the mean is. And then for the standard deviation of 8, you would draw a line about halfway over to the right and show the standard deviation of 8. Um, many populations, because they have so many scores within that population, we, we use a smooth curve instead of just a regular um, histogram to show this. Um, again, the standard deviation is shown about halfway across one side. Remember that one whole side of the curve covers about two standard deviations. Remember 95% of the scores are within two standard deviations of the mean. So we just want to go about halfway across because we want to show how far one standard deviation is. Um, a second graph that you can use is, again, the histogram. Um, this shows a sample with a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of 2. So you put a, a black line at the mean of 16 there and put m equals 16 for the sample. And then the standard deviation is, is 2. So because there's a number line here, the standard deviation of 2, you can show it is exactly 2 units. So 16 is the mean. So the red arrow would go all the way to 18 on one side and it would go to 14 on the other side. So you would show two in both directions. All right, let's talk about transforming. So adding a constant to each score does not change the shape of the standard deviation. Instead, it just moves the same distribution with the same shape to the right. It does affect the mean and it adds that same constant to the mean. Subtracting a constant from each score would move the entire distribution to the left. Again, the shape would remain the same. The scores would not be more spread out. Therefore, variability would be the same. This means, again, standard deviation would be the same. So let's look at the curve on the left here, the yellow curve. The mean is about 63. If you added a constant of 7 to every score in the distribution, you would have what looks like the blue curve on the right. So basically, the new mean would become 70. So by adding seven points to every single score and regraphing it, the graph looks exactly the same. The variability is exactly the same. The second graph is not more condensed or spread out than the first. And this means that the standard deviation is exactly the same. So if you simply add seven points to a distribution, you can basically just add seven points to the mean and the standard deviation remains exactly the same. Okay, let's look at a, an example. Say you add five points to every score in a population that has a mean of 40 and a standard deviation of 20. Well, say you had a score of 41 on this test and your friend had a score of 43. Well, the distance between your scores is two points, right? 43 minus 41. Well, now let's add five points to your scores. So your new score, instead of 41, well, now it's a 46, and your friend's new score is now a 48. But look at the distance between those scores. It's still just two points. So adding a constant to every score only shifts the entire distribution, does not affect variability, because the deviation scores don't change. Hence, the standard deviation remains the same. Therefore, by adding five points to every score in the population, the mean is now 45, but the standard deviation is still at 20. It does not change. All right, let's look at a normal curve with standard deviations and scores. Okay, so we've talked about the normal curve before, and we've kind of looked at the percentages, and we kind of know a little bit about what they mean. So if you label the normal curve at the bottom with your standard deviations going from negative 3 on the far left to 0 right at the mean in the middle to positive 3 on the far right, that covers 99.9% .9 of all scores. So again, if you're between negative 1 standard deviation and positive 1 standard deviation, can you see that that's about 68 to 70% of all scores are within that range? And then if you actually look at negative 2, standard deviations all the way to positive two standard deviations, that's about 95% of all scores. Okay, so that's a really important number to know. All right, so let's say we have an example and we're gonna look at IQ scores. Well, one popular IQ test uses a mean of 100. 
So the way I would write this on my graph is I would just kind of write it right below the standard deviation. I would put 100. And then to get to the next standard deviation, the first I have to be told what the standard deviation is. So on this particular IQ test, it has a standard deviation of 15. So that means in order to get to an SD equal to 1, I have to add 15 points to get to the next X value. So if I'm going from 100 at, at, at the mean to go one standard deviation, I add 15 and I get 115. If I want to go two standard deviations, I'm going to have a score of 130. And if I'm going to go to three standard deviations, I'm going to have a score of 145. And I can go backwards the other way too. If I need to know what minus one standard deviation is, I just subtract 15 points from the mean and I get 85. And I subtract again and I get 70. And I subtract again and get 55. So in the problems in this class, I am typically don't draw the normal curve every single time. I typically just draw that number line at the bottom showing the X values and the standard deviations. So just know when we talk about that in class, I really mean that there's a normal curve above the number line. I just don't like to draw it every time. It gets a little tedious. Let's look at extreme distributions. When a score is greater than two standard deviations away from the mean, it's typically considered an extreme score. So let's say we have a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of two. Is a score of seven an extreme score? Or is it a central score in there with the other 95% of the scores, which are within one or two standard deviations of the mean? So step one, I would create a number line and label the scores and the standard deviations. So the standard deviation line is easy, goes from negative three to positive three. And a standard deviation of zero is always where the mean is located. So I know that this sample has a mean of 10. So I put it in right above the zero on the X row. Okay, they, I was told that the standard deviation of two for this problem. So I start at the mean of two and I add two points to get to the first standard deviation, two more points to get to the next, two more points to get to the next. And then I subtract two points to get negative one standard deviations, subtract two more to get negative two, subtract two more to get negative three standard deviations. So your table should look like this when you're finished. Finally, what I would do next is draw kind of a dark line around um, the SD equals two and the SD equals negative two. So basically this is showing me that 95% of my scores are gonna be between negative two standard deviations and positive two standard deviations. Anything on the outside of those lines are gonna be an outlier. So now I look at my row. Where does my score of seven fall? Is it between the two lines or is it outside? Keep in mind that a standard deviation of negative two corresponds to six and a standard deviation of positive two corresponds to 14. So if I have any number between six and 14, it's gonna be a central score. So is seven between six and 14 or is it outside of six and 14? Is it an extreme score, which would be a score less than six or a score greater than 14? In this problem, seven is a central score. It is with the other 95% of scores that fall between negative two and positive two standard deviations. All right, let's talk about transformations of scale. Multiplying each score by a constant does change the standard deviation. It stretches the distribution out further apart. The scores will become more spread out the mean and the standard deviation would also be multiplied by that same score. So here's an example, given a mean of three and a standard deviation of two. Multiply each score by four. The new mean becomes three times four, which is 12, and the new standard deviation becomes two times four, which is eight. Dividing each score by a constant would shrink the entire distribution shape. The scores would become closer together. The mean and the standard deviation would also be divided by that same score. So my example is I have a mean of six and a standard deviation of four. Divide each score by two. My new mean becomes six divided by two, which is three. And my new standard deviation becomes four divided by two, which is two. So I want you to look at an example here. I'm given scores and I ask you to compute the mean and standard deviation, okay? So the way that I would do this 
is I would go into SPSS. This problem has four different parts. So the first part, you're just computing the mean and standard deviation. The second part, you're adding three to every score, computing the new mean and standard deviation. The third part, you're multiplying each score by two, and you're computing a new mean and standard deviation. And the next part, you're dividing each original score by two and computing the new mean and new standard deviation. So I would go into SPSS and type your original scores in. Um, you can step one shows how to do this if you like to do this and I would just do descriptive statistics okay so you're going to notice that if I just have my x scores the original scores the mean is 5 and the standard deviation is 1.5 well if I do an x plus 3 and I add 3 to every single score my new mean is now 8 my standard deviation is still 1.5. So just like we talked about, adding a constant to every score only adds that constant to the mean. So the original mean was 5. When we added plus 3 to it, it now became 8. And the standard deviation remained the same when we added a constant, both at 1.85. However, look at x times 2, the column that I made. If you look at the mean there, it's 10. And look at the standard deviation, it's 3.7. So when you multiply an original distribution by a constant, can you see that the mean has also multiplied by 2? Instead of 5, it's now 10. The standard deviation has also been multiplied by 2. It is now 3.7. The same thing happens for division. The mean is now divided by 2 because all the scores were divided by 2. So instead of 5, the mean is now 2.5. Instead of 1.85 as standard deviation, the new one is 0.93. So let's look at this graph. It kind of shows you what happened here. So the graph in blue is your original scores. Okay. And if you look at the yellow, it's x plus 3. Notice that the graph looks exactly the same. It's just been shifted to the right. So that's why your standard deviation didn't change when you added. It just shifted to the right. However, look at the orange one. That's 2 times x. I multiplied every single score by 2. So if I had a score of 1, actually this distribution started with a score of 2. If I had a score of 2 and I multiplied that by 2, it now became a score of 4. Um, the scores that were 4 and I multiplied those by 2 now became a score of 8. So see the dotted 8? And you do that for every score. You multiply it. So what happens? The orange one gets stretched way out. In fact, it's twice as far as it used to be because I multiplied every score by 2. So when you multiply scores, standard deviation gets however large you multiply by. I multiply by 2 here, so it gets twice as big. Okay, So the mean is twice as big, and the standard deviation is twice as big. Now look at the little gray graph. That's where I took the original scores and divided it in half. Notice how narrow the curve is now? That's because we divided every score by 2. So the standard deviation is also divided by 2, and it's much smaller. The scores are much closer together. All right, how would you report this in the literature? Well, many journals use the symbol SD to represent standard deviation, and I'm sure you've seen that in class. I use it quite often. So if you had to write out your results, you might see something like this. Children who viewed the violent cartoon displayed more aggressive responses with a mean of 12.45 and a standard deviation equals 3.70. Then those who viewed the control cartoon with a mean of 4.22 and a standard deviation of 1.04. Um, if you have groups, they might report it like this. The number of aggressive behaviors for male and female adolescents after playing a violent video game. And then you might show it in a table format. So the males who played violent video games and the females who played violent video games, you can see their means and their standard deviations. And then the same exact thing for those who played nonviolent video games, what the mean and standard deviation was. All right, here's another way to report literature. We can use plots and tables. So researchers examined whether dogs could evaluate people by watching other dogs interact with them. A nice person gave the demonstrator dog attention and the ignoring person did not. How much time the dog who watched spent with each person was recorded? So a box plot, which is the one on the right, shows the minimum and maximum scores as well as Q1, Q2, and Q3. So at each end of the box plot, you can see 
those are the maximum minimum. So look at the smaller box plot. You see it starts at about 2 and it goes up to about 10. So 2 is the lowest score recorded. 10 is the highest score recorded for the nice person. And then the yellow box starts on the lower end at the first quartile, Q1. So it's about 4. And Q3 is recorded and it goes up to about Q, about 7, 7 times. So Q3 is at seven, and then you can see the median is the middle line there. So six is the median for that first set of data. So box plots are pretty easy to understand if you know what they mean. And then look at the table on the left. If I just say the median time for a nice person is six and the interquartile range is three, it's kind of hard for people to understand that table. So box plots are kind of where it's at. Again, to find the interquartile range, you just look at the top and bottom of the yellow box. So for the first one, again, the top of the yellow box was at 7. The bottom of the yellow box was at 4. To find the interquartile range, you just subtract 7 minus 4 and get 3. Okay, so three-point difference between the first and the last, the third quartile. All right, standard deviation and descriptive statistics. Standard deviation describes variability by measuring distance from the mean. In any distribution, some individuals will be close to the mean, others will be relatively far from the mean. Standard deviation provides a measure of the typical or standard distance from the mean. Remember, there is great variability in studying people or animals. People have different attitudes, opinions, talents, IQs, and personalities, and this influences their variability. All right, let's talk about how we would describe an entire distribution. So remember in a normal distribution, you have about 68 to 70 percent of the scores within one standard deviation and about 95 percent of the scores within two standard deviations of the mean. So here's how you might write that. Here is a histogram. Um, it has 20 scores. The mean is 36. So I draw a red line. I show a mean of 36 and the standard deviation is 4. So I count over 4 from 36 and at 40 I put a dotted line and I draw my arrow for s equals 4. And then I go to the left. I draw the dotted line at 32 because the standard deviation again is 4 to the left. And then I draw my arrow and I write s equals 4. Um, here's an analogy for the mean and standard deviation. They're not overly complex, but this analogy helps you kind of understand the methods. Um, in our local community, the site for New High School was selected because it provided a central location. An alternate site on the western edge of the community was considered, but this site was rejected because it would require extensive busing for students who live on the east side. So in this example, the location of the high school is analogous to the concept of the mean. Just as the high school is located in the center of the community, the mean is located in the center of the distribution. For each student in the community, it's possible to measure the distance between home and the new high school. Some students only live a few blocks from the new high school and others live as much as three miles away. So the average distance the students must travel to school was calculated to be 0.8 miles. The average distance from school is analogous to the concept of the standard deviation. That is the standard deviation measures the standard distance from an individual score to the mean. It's kind of like the average of how much each of them had to go to get a school. So let's look at variance and inferential statistics. The goal of inferential statistics is to detect meaningful and significant patterns in research. Low variability means existing patterns can easily be seen. The scores are really close, clustered close together. High variability can obscure patterns because the scores are really spread out. So in inferential statistics, the variance of sample data is often classified as error variance. This term indicates that sample variance represents unexplained and uncontrolled differences between scores. High variance makes it difficult to see if there's a difference between sets of scores. So look at your graph. Treatment A, all the scores are clustered together around the mean of 10. They go from 9 to 11. And for treatment B, all the scores are clustered around the mean of 15, which goes from 14 to 16. So that first graph, experiment A, it's really easy to see that the two experiments are different from each other. The variability is very small. They're both clustered around their prospective means. But look at experiment B. They're kind of all mixed up, right? The, the mean of treatment A is 10, and the mean of treatment B is 15, same as in the first treatment. But look how spread out they, they are. 
the variability is really large in treatment B, so it's really hard to tell if there's differences that exist because there, there's so many overlapping points, okay? All right, learning check problem one. Pause the video, see if you can figure out the answer. In a normal shape distribution with the mean of 40 and standard deviation is five, how would the mean and standard deviation be represented? Well, the mean would be represented by a vertical line that you would draw at x equals 40, and the standard deviation would be represented by a horizontal line that goes all the way up to x equals 45. Because that's five points above the mean, your standard deviation is five. Learning check problem two, pause the video. If five points are added to every score in a population with a mean of 45 and a standard deviation of six, what are the new values for the mean and standard deviation? So when you add points to a score, you only add points to the mean. The standard deviation remains the same. So the mean is now 50, but the standard deviation stays the same at six. Problem three, pause the video. Okay, a research study obtains a mean of 12.7 and a standard deviation of 2.3. How do we report this? Part B is the answer. You type M equals 12.7 and SD equals 2.3. All right, this problem is a little more onerous, so let's see if we can do it. Which of the following distributions would X equals 35 be most extreme? Um, 35 could be a central score. By most extreme, it's asking the question about which score is furthest from the mean here. So you look at the number part of the standard deviation. You don't care about the sign. It doesn't matter. So A, B, C, or D. Well, I'm going to check each part. For part A, I'm going to draw my number line. I'm going to put in my standard deviation of of, I made mean, my mean of 30 and my standard deviation of five points. I'm going to count by fives to label the rest of my graph. And then I'm going to draw the dark lines on either side of the negative two and the positive two standard deviations. So I know 95% of my scores. So if I'm looking um, for the question which says which one would have x equals 35 be most extreme, well, in this case, x equals 35 gives a standard deviation of 1. Okay, I'm going to repeat this for the next set of data. Put my mean at 30, standard deviation of 10, so I'm going to count by 10s. And a x of 35 here would be halfway between 0 and 1 standard deviations, or 0 0.5. All right, the next set of data has a mean of 25, and then the standard deviation of 5, so I'm going to count by 5s. Um, and x of 35 here gives a standard deviation of 2. That's pretty far away from the mean. And then the last set, part D, standard deviation of 10, so I'm counting by 10s. And a score of 35 gives a standard deviation of 1. So which one is the most extreme, is the most farther away from the mean? Well, standard deviation equals 2 is furthest away from the mean, so C would be your answer here. And finally, learning check example five. Pause the video. So we have one sample that's selected to represent scores in treatment one and a second sample that's used to represent scores of treatment two. Which set of sample statistics would represent the clearest picture of a real mean between the two treatments? Okay, so to solve these problems I have to look at at my number line and then draw my number line in. And, and when I do it for this one with two samples, I usually put SD in the middle and I put X, the first sample above and the second sample below so that the standard deviations kind of separate them out. Well, if I'm told the variance is 15 to find standard deviation, I just take the square root of it. That gives me a standard deviation of 3.9. So for each score, like for the first set, I put 40, in the middle of where standard deviation is zero, I put a mean of 40, and then I add 3.9 points to get to the first standard deviation, add another 3.9 points to get to the second one, and then I subtract to find the other two. Then I'm gonna do the same thing for my second treatment, which I'm calling X2. So I'm told that the mean of the second treatment is 45, so I put 45 in the middle, and then again, I'm gonna add 3.9 points and add 3.9 and then subtract to get to the lower numbers. 
So let's read this. So basically I know that 95% of the scores from treatment one would go from 32.2 all the way to 47.8. And I would know that 95% of scores from treatment two would go from 37.2 to 52.8. There would be a lot of overlap in these scores. Um, all the way from 37.2 to 47.8 from treatment one would also be included in treatment two. That's a lot of overlap in those scores. Then I would do the same procedure for each one. So the second, the third, and the fourth one. And basically what I find is that for B, there's the smallest amount of overlap. Only a few scores are in both distributions from 41.6 to 43.4 would be in both distributions. So the overlap would be the smallest. So it would give you the clearest picture of a real mean.